guys, I'm Miguel Sanchez, and welcome to episode 3 of Movie History, Walt Disney Animation Studios. Yay. So this is our most recent series here on the channel, alongside the Moshi Mashup League and Moshi Sleep Story Reactions. The Moshi Mashup League will have a new up uh, we'll have day 3 of Moshi Sleep Mashup League tomorrow, and then, uh, but we do have two new episodes of Moshi Sleep Story Reactions later on today, so stay tuned. Man, it's going to be a lot of fun. So, hope, hopefully this learns your lesson by now, because when things go right, we do it together. All right, are you ready for this? Let's get started. For this episode, we're going to take a look at a theatrical feature where music and classical where classical music and animation collide. So, if you're ready for this, right, let's get started. For episode three, we are taking a look at Fantasia. So, this is going to be a whole lot of fun. Yay! Let's go. I know it's... Because this is definitely the right time to take a look at a feature film uh, with the right that's that that has the right time to do so. So, thank you for coming and welcome to Movie History Walt Disney Animation Studios, and we're gonna get started right now. And if you haven't seen our previous episode, which was episode, the which episode two, where we took a look at at uh, Pinocchio, the link to that will be on the top right corner of the screen. Up there, you can see the info so for you to click, click click right now. But for now, let's not waste any more time here. Let's just go ahead and get started. Here we go. All right, so, so uh, all right, so let's see what the movie is about. Fantasia is a 1940 anime, American animated film produced by Walt Disney and released by Walt Disney Productions with a story direction by Joe Grant and Dick H Humor and production supervision by Ben Sharpstein. The third Disney animated feature film. It consists of eight animated segments set to, set to pieces of classical music conducted by um, conducted by Leopold Stokowski, seven of which are performed by the, Phil by the Philadelphia Cl Orchestra. Music critic... A music critic and composer Deems Taylor acts as the film's master of ceremonies, who introduces each se segment in live action. Disney settled on the film's concept in 1938 as work near completion on The Sorcerer's Apprentice, originally an elaborate silly symphony cartoon designed as a comeback role for, for Mickey Mouse, who had declined in popularity. As production costs surpassed what the short could earn, Disney decided to include it, it in it, a feature length film. Of multi of multiple seg segments set to classical pieces with Stokowski and Taylor as collaborators, the soundtrack was recorded using multiple audio channels and, and reproduced with Fantasound, a pioneering sound to the pioneering sound system developed by Disney and RCA that made Fantasia the first commercial film shown in stereo and a precursor to surround sound. I don't know. Um, Fantasia was first released as a theatrical roadshow held in 13 cities across the U.S. between 1940 and 1941. The first began at the Broadway Theater in New York City on November 13, 1940. With, while acclaimed by critics, it, it failed to, to make a profit due to World War II cutting off distribution to the European market. The film's high production costs and the expense of building fantasy and equipment of and leasing theaters for the for the roadshow presentations. Since 1942, the film has been reissued multiple times with its original footage and audio being deleted. And audio being deleted, modified, or restored in each version. With, with adjusted for inflation, Fantasia is the is the 24th highest grossing film of all time in the US. The Fantasia franchise has grown to include video games, Disneyland attractions, and a live concert series. Uh, a sequel, Fantasia 2000, co-produced by Walt's nephew, Roy E. Disney, was released in 1999. And I'll talk about Fantasia 2000 in a future episode, so please stay tuned for it. I'll let you know when it comes out. Uh, Fantasia has grown in, in reputation over the years and is now widely acclaimed. In 1998, the American Film Institute ranked it as the 58th greatest American film in, in their 100 years, 100 movies, and, their, uh, and the 5th greatest animated film in their 10 top 10 list. In 1990, Fantasia was selected for presentation for preservation in the United States National uh, National Film Registry by the Library by the Library of Congress as being culturally, culturally, historically, or or aesthetically significant. So, yeah, that's all I gotta say. Looking at the stats for the movie, direct, it was directed by Samuel Archer, James Elgar, Bill Rogers, Bill Roberts, Paul Satterfield, Ben Sharpstein, David H. David D. Hand, Hamilton Lusk, Jim Hanley, Ford B. B, B, B T. He, Norman Ferguson, and Wilfred Jackson. Own. It, it was produced by Walt Disney and Ben Sharpstein. Uh, story by Joe Grant and Dick Humor. Story Leopold Stokowski and Deems Taylor. An area by Deems Taylor. Music by. See the program. I see the program. As you can see, uh, you, you, we'll see the program in a moment. Um, cinematography is by James Wan Ho. Production companies Walt Disney Productions. Distributed by Walt Disney Productions and RKO Radio Pictures. Release date November 13, 1940. Running time is, 100, is 126 minutes. Country is the United States. Language is English. Budget $2.28 million. 
but at the box office, they made seventy six point four to eighty three point three million dollars, <laughs> and that's pretty much it. So yes, yeah, pretty much it. Now let's get to the program. Um, Fantasia opens with a live action with, with live action scenes of of an orchestra or gallery against a blue background and tuning their instruments in high light, half shadow, in half light, half shadow. Masters of Master of Ceremonies, Deems Taylor enters the stage also in half light, half shadow, and introduces the program. Tokata and Few by D in D minor by Cho. Uh, Tokata F U in D minor by Johann Sebastian Bach. Live action shots of the orchestra of the orchestra illuminated in blue and gold, backed by superimposed shadows, faint ash patterns, anime lines, shapes, and clouds, and cloud formations reflect the sound and rhythms of the music. The Nutcracker Suite by Piotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky. Selections are from the ballet suite underscore scenes. Depicting the change of the seasons from from summer to autumn to winter. Oh my gosh. A variety of dances are presented with fairies, fish, flowers, mushrooms, and leaves, including dance the sugar plum fairy, Chinese dance, Arabian dance, Russian dance, dance of flutes, and waltz of the flowers. The Sorcerer's Apprentice by Paul Duca. Based on Goethe's 1797 poem, Der Zahnberling, Mickey Mouse, the young apprentice of the sorcerer Yen Sid, which is spelled Disney, which is Disney, spelled backwards, uh, attempts some of his master, master's magic tricks, but does not know how to control them. Bright of Spring by Igor Stravinsky. Uh, 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 a visual history of the Earth's the beginnings is depicted to select to select the selections of the ballet score. The sequence progresses from the planet's uh, formation for to the first living creatures, followed by the reign of uh, followed by the reign extinction of the of the dinosaurs. Animation slash meet the soundtrack. The orchestra, the orchestra musicians depart, and the Fantasia title card is revealed. At the intermission, there is a brief jam session of jazz music led by a clarinetist, led by a clarinetist, as the orchestra members return. Then a humorously styled demonstration of how sound is re is rendered on on the film uh, on film is shown. Animated soundtrack character. Initially, a uh, straight white line. The cha uh, changes into different shapes and colors based on the sounds play. The Pastoral Symphony by, Lu by Ludwig von Beethoven. A mythical Greco-Roman world of colorful centaur and centaurettes. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. Uh, Cupids, fonts, and other figures from classical mythology is portrayed to Beethoven's music. A gathering for a festival to, to honor Bacchus, the god of wine is is interrupted by Zeus, who creates a storm and directs and directs Vulcan to forge lightning bolts for him to throw at the attendees. Uh oh, uh, Dance of the Hours by uh, by Milcare Poncielli, a comic ballet in four sections. But uh, Upanova and her ostriches for the morning, Hyacinth Hippo and her servants in the afternoon. And Edifantine and her bumper blowing elephant troop for the evening, and Ben Alligator and his troop of alligators for the night. The, the finale finds all the characters dancing together until their palace collapses. All right, Night on Bald Mountain by by Bodes Bukowski and Ave Maria by Frank Schubert. At midnight, the devil Chernobyl awakes and summons evil spirits and restless souls for the from their graves to Bald Mountain. Their spirits, the spirits dance and fly through through the air until driven driven back by sound of an angelus spell. As night fades into dawn, a chorus is heard singing Ave Maria as a line of road monks is depicted walking with lighted torches through a forest and, uh, and into the ruins of a cathedral. So, yeah, that's the program. That and that does it for the Fantasia program, ladies and gentlemen. Man, how does it get here? That, that's a lot. Anyways, um, I know. Moving on to the production. Start with the development. The Source of Apprentice. In 1936, Walt Disney felt that the, the, the that the Disney Studios star character Mickey Mouse needed a boost in popularity. He decided to feature the mouse in the Source of Apprentice, a deluxe cartoon short based on the 1737 poem. Written by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, uh, von Goethe and set to the 1897 orchestral piece by Paul Dukas, inspired by the original tale. 
The concept of matching animation to classical music was usually as early as 1928 in Disney's cartoon series, The Silly Symphonies. But he wanted to go beyond the usual slapstick and produce shorts where sheer fantasy unfolds. Um, action controlled by a musical pattern that has great charm in the realm of unreality. Upon receiving the rights to use the music by the end of, Ju of July 1937, Disney considered using, you know, using a well-known conductor to record the music for, uh, for added prestige. He happened to meet Leopold Stokowski, conductor of the Philadelphia Orchestra since 1912, and Chasson's restaurant in Hollywood, and talked about his plans for, for the tour. Stokowski recalled that he did like that uh, he did like the music, was happy to collaborate on the project and offered to conduct the piece at no cost. Following their meeting, Disney's New York representative ran into Stokowski on a train headed for the East Coast. In writing to uh, in writing to Disney, he reported that Stokowski you know, was really serious in, in his offer to do the music for nothing. He had some very interesting ideas on instrument coloring, which would be perfect for an, for an animation medium. In his excited re response, dated October 26, 1937, Disney wrote that he felt all steamed up over the idea of Sukowski working for us. The union of Sukowski and his music together, uh, his music together with the best of our medium, would be would be the means of a success and should lead to a new style of motion picture presentation. He had already begun working on a story on a story outline and wished to use the finest men from color down to the animators on the tour. The Source of Apprentice was to was to be promoted as a special and, and rented to theaters as a unique film outside the Mickey Mouse cartoon series. An arrangement signed by Disney and Sikowski on December 16, 1937 allowed the conductor to select and employ a complete symphony orchestra the symphony orchestra to, for the recording. Stokowski was paid $5,000 for his work. Disney hired a stage at the Culver Studios in California for the session. It began at midnight on January 9, 1938 and lasted for three hours for using 85 Hollywood musicians. Well, boy, that's a whole lot. Moving over to the expansion for, for the expansion to feature film. As production costs of the Source of Sopranos climbed to $125,000, it became clear to Disney and his brother Roy, who managed the studio's finances. The sh that the short could never earn such a sum black on its own. Roy wanted his brother to keep any additional costs on the film not to a bit on. He said, because of this, because of its very experimental un and unprecedented nature, we have no idea what can be expected from such a production. Oh my gosh. Ben Sarpsheen, a, a production supervisor on Fantasia, noted that, th that the its budget was three to four times greater than the usual Silly Symphony. But Disney solved this trouble in the form of an opportunity. This was the birth of a new concept, a group of separate numbers, regardless of their running time, put together in a single presentation. It turned out to be a concert, something new, something novel of high, and of high quality. I ideas to produce a complete feature film were pursued in February 1938, when inquiries were made to extend Stokowski's contract. You know, in August, Disney asked Stokowski's representative to have him return to the studio's to select material for the new film, which was initially titled The Concert Feature. Disney agreed to pay Sikowski $80,000 plus royalties for his services. The pair further thought of presenting the film with, uh, with an on-screen host to introduce each number in the program. Both had heard composer and, uh, and music critic Deems Taylor uh, provide inf intermission commentary during radio broadcasts of the New York Philharmonic and agreed that he would be most suitable for the role. Disney did contract Taylor about the project, but then, but by, but by then, work on Pinocchio, Bambi, and, um, and development on his new Broadway studio kept him too busy to work on, uh, on, on the new feature. In a change of plans, Taylor was asked during a call on September 3rd, 1930, 1938, to leave to come to the studios as soon as possible. He left New York City for Los Angeles by train two days later for a month's visit. So, yeah, that's pretty much all because I'll be here. Let's go to the story beings and program selection. It's going to be a long one, so, so, stay, so be prepared. Um, Taylor arrived at the studio one day after a series of meetings began to select the musical pieces for the concert feature. Disney made story writers Joe Grant and, and Dick Humor gathered a pre the preliminary selection of music along with Stokowski. Taylor 
and, and the heads of various of de departments discussed their ideas. Meeting, each meeting was recorded, the, 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 was recorded in the verbatim by the, the stenographers, with particular the, with participants being given a copy of the entire conversation for review. As selections were as, as selections were considered, a recording of the piece was located and played back at, at the next gathering. Disney did not contribute much. How much to early discussions? He admitted that uh, that his knowledge of music was instinct instinctive and untrained. In, in what we he inquired about a piece on which he well, on which we might bring something uh, we might we might build something of a prehistoric time with animals. The group was considering the Firebird by Igor Stravinsky, but Taylor noted that his Le Sacre du Printemps would be would be something of, on that order. To which, uh, to which Disney replied upon hearing a recording, "This is marvelous. It would be perfect for prehistoric animals. There would be some. Uh, there, there, there would be something terrific in the in dinosaurs, flying lizards, and resort monsters. There could be, there could be beauty in in the settings. Oh my gosh! So yes, I know. Um, numerous choices were discarded as talks continued, including Moto per." Roberto Perpetuo by Niccolo Paganini with shots of dynamos, cogs, and pistons and rolling wheels to show the production of of a color button. Of the three, the material included Prelude in G minor and Troika by Sir by Sir Jail by Sir Gal the 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 off and a rendition of. The Song of the Flea by uh, by Mussorgsky, which ha which was sung <laughs> to be sung by Lawrence Tippett on September 29, 1938, of around 60 of Disney's and artists gathered for a two and a half hour piano concert when, while he provided a running commentary about the new musical feature. A rough version of The Sorcerer's Apprentice was also shown that, according to one attendee, had the crowd applauding and cheering until their hands were red. The final pieces were chosen. Uh, were chosen the following morning, which included Toccata and Fugue in D minor, the 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 by Gabriel Pierre, the Nutcracker Suite, Nail Ball Mountain, Ivan Maria, Dance of the Hours, Clara de Lune by Claude by Claude Debussy, The Right Spring, and The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Disney had already begun working out. Working out the details for the segments and showed greater enthusiasm and eagerness as opposed to his anxiety while starting while starting on Pinocchio. So yes, oh, let's move on. Claire de Lune was soon removed from the Fantasia program, but Disney had and his writers encountered problems. Uh, but but Disney and his, uh, his writers encountered problems of setting a concrete story to see the least. Uh, to see the least, it's it's already March. The entry of the little uh, of the little fawns attracted Disney to. Look at the to the piece at which, uh, at which first provided suitable depictions for a fonts he wanted, what he wanted on January fifth, nineteen thirty nine. Following a search for a stronger piece that fit to fit the mythology, uh, the mythological piece, the mythological theme, the piece was replaced with sections of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. Stokowski, uh, so, uh, so, uh, Stokowski disagreed from uh, with the switch, believing that Disney's idea of mythology. Uh, of mythology is not quite what this symphony is about. He was also concerned about the reception from classical music enthusiasts who had criticized for Disney for venturing too far from the composer's intent. Taylor, on the other hand, welcomed, uh, welcomed the change, describing it as a stunning one and saw no one and uh, no possible objection to it. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right. Um, the new feature continued to be known as the concert feature or musical feature. As late as November 1938, Howard, a publicist for Disney's film distributor RKL Radio Pictures, wished for a different title and gave the suggestion. Gave the suggestion film, harmon the film harmonic concert. Stuart Buchanan then held a con contest at the studio for a title that produced almost uh, almost 1,800 suggestions, including including Bach to Stravinsky and uh, Bach to Stravinsky and Bach. And Hybrowski by by Sokowski. But still, the favorite among the film's supervisors was Fantasia, an early working title that had even grown on horn. It isn't a word alone, 
but the meaning we read into it. For the beginning of his development, Disney expressed uh, the, the greater the great importance of music in Fantasia compared to his uh, his his past work. In order in our ordinary stuff in ordinary stuff, our music is always under action. But on this, we're supposed to be picturing this music, not the music fitting our story. Disney hoped that the film would bring classical music to to, to people who, like himself, have previously walked out on this kind of stuff. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's let's go to the segments. Over one thousand artists and technicians work with them that were used in the making of Fantasia, which features more than five thousand animated characters. Which more than five hundred animated characters. Segments were color keyed scene. They were, were color keyed scene by scene, so the colors in a single shot were harmonized between preceding and following ones. Before a hard science there to have was complete, an overall color scheme was designed to the general mood of, of the music and and pattern to correspond with the development of the subject matter. The studio's character model and, to, and department would also sculpt three-dimensional clay models so the animators could view their subject from all angles. The live action scenes were uh, were filmed using the three steps uh, the technical process, while the animated segments were shot were shot in successive yellow, cyan, and magenta exposed frames. The different pieces of a film were then were then spliced together to form a complete print. A multiplane camera that could uh, that could handle seven levels, three more than the old multiplane camera were was built. So yeah, let's go. Let's, see. let's start with the first segment: Takata and Fuyuki D Minor. Disney had been, uh, has been interested in producing after animation since he saw a color box by Lynn Lee live in 1935. He explained the work done in the Takata and Fugue. In, in, in Takata and Fugue was no sudden idea. There was something where, uh, that we had nursed along several years, but we never had a chance to try. Preliminary designs included those from effects animator Cy Young, who produced drawings influenced by the patterns on the edge of a piece of sound film. In, 19, in late 1938, Disney hired Oscar Fischinger, a German artist who had produced numerous after anime films, including, uh, including some of classical music, to work with uh, to work with Young. Upon reviewing uh, a proper review of the of three Laker reels produced by the two, Disney rejected all three. According to humor, all Fischinger, all Fischinger did was little triangles as designs. It didn't come off at all. Too tiki, Walt said. Fischer, like Disney, was used to have I mean, full control over his work and was not used to working a group. Any group. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, clearly, his designs were too abstract for a mass audience. Fischer left the studio in a in apparent despair before the segment was completed. In October 1939, Disney plans had plans to make the Takata and Fugue an experimental 3D three-dimensional film with the audiences being given cardboard stereoscopic frames with 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 their souvenir programs but this idea was abandoned so yeah that's all I gonna say next seven is the Nutcracker Suite in the Nutcracker Suite an uh, animator Ar Arts Babbitt is said to have credited the three stooges as a guide for animating the dancing mushrooms in the Chinese dance front the uh, Chinese dance routine he drew with a musical score pinned to his desk to work out the choreography so he could relate the action to the melody and the counterpart. And the counterpoint, those nasty little th notes underneath. So something had to, it has to be related to that. The studio filmed professional dancers, Joyce, uh, the Joyce Coil Coles, and uh, the Marjorie, uh, the Marjorie Belcher, wearing ballet skirts that resemble shapes of. Blossoms that were uh, that were to sit above the water for for dance of the flutes, and an Arabian dancer was also brought in to study uh, to study the movements for the goldfish in uh, in Arab dance. Jules Engel also worked on the choreography and color keying for the sequence. Yeah, I get it. That's all I gotta say. Move, move, move on. Next up is the Sorcerer's Apprentice. Adoration of the Sorcerer's Apprentice began on January 21st, 1938, when James Algar, the director of the segment, assigned an animator Preston Blair to work on the scene when Mickey Mouse wakes from his uh, from his dream. Each of the 700 members of staff at the time received a synopsis of 
go with this 1797 poem, Die Sonderlehrling, uh, where a counter to complete a 20 question for that require uh, their ideas on what action might take place. Leia artist Tom Codrick created what Dick Humor described as brilliantly colored thumbnails from preliminary storyboard sketches using gouache paints, which featured bolder use of color and lightning, uh, and lightning than any previous Disney short. Mickey was redesigned by animator Fred Moore, who added pupils to his eyes for the first time to achieve greater ranges of expression. Most of the segments, most, uh, most of the segments were shot in live action, including a scene where, where a UCLA athlete was uh, was asked to run and jump across one of the studio's sound stages with barrels in the way, which was used for reference when Mickey traverses through water. So, yeah, so let's go and say, say that we have next up is Rider Spring. Um, an early concept for Rider Spring was to extend the story uh, to the age of mammals and the first humans uh, uh, and the uh, and the discovery of fire uh, of fire and man's triumph Ja Hively, the second director art the seventh art director explained that it was later curtailed by Disney to avoid controversy for creationists who later promised to make trouble should he connect evolution with humans humans to gain a better understanding of the, of the history of the Planet, the studio received guidance from Roy Chapman Andrews, the director of the American Museum of Natural History, English biologist Jul Julia Huxley, paleontologist Bart Barton Brown, and astronomer Edwin Hubble, and animators studied the study comets and nebulae and nebulae at the Mount Wilson Observatory, and and observed a herd of iguanas and a baby alligator that were brought into the studio. The viewpoint was kept low. Through uh, throughout the segment and uh, to hide the immensity of dinosaurs. So yeah, now you know. So I'm gonna say that we have the pastoral symphony. According to Ward Kimball, the animators were extremely specific on touchy issues in the making of the pastoral symphony. Greek mythol uh, Greek, Greek mythological segments. The female centaurs were originally drawn bare breasted, but the Hayes office enforcing the motion picture production code insisted that they discreetly hung garlands around the the necks. The male centaurs were also toned down to appeal. To appear less intimidating to the audience. Originally, black female centaurs braided the braided picken, the pickanini, the pickanini hair, shining the hooves and grooming the tails of of white centaurs. <laughs> appeared in the film, but this was cut out years later for racial prejudicial the the prejudicial reasons. See. That's just controversy. So yeah, now you know. Now we have Dance of the Hours. Dance of the Hours was directed by by Norman Ferguson and Thornton He and was completed by eleven animators. Most of the stories most of the story was outlined in a meeting in October nineteen thirty eight, including the creation of the main alligator creator character, Ben Alligator. Its story, direction, layout, and animation underwent several rewrites. Yet Disney wanted to present animals to perform uh, perform a a legitimate uh, caricature ballet sequence with Comedic slips. The design of the uh, of the elements and alligators were based on those of German illustrator Heinrich Klee, while the hippos and ostriches were based on those by cartoonist T. S. Sullivan. To gain better uh, to gain a better idea on the animals' movement movements, the crew visited the Griffith Park Zoo uh, in, in Los Angeles. Animator John Hench was assigned to work on the segment, but resisted as he knew uh, li little about ballet. Disney then gave uh, uh, the Hench season uh, tickets to the Ballet Russe to Monte Carlo with backstage access so he could learn more about it. The studio uh, about it. the studio uh, the studio filmed several people in live action to help with the animation of the character uh, of the characters. The Leotrich Ma uh, uh, Ma Moise Upanova is based on Irina Baranova, highest of hippo. The prima ballerina was inspired by dancers Marge Champion and Tatiana Ryabochinska uh, and actress Harry no uh, Noel, who weighed over 200 pounds or, or 91 kilograms. The, uh, the, the anime is studying the least, the least quiver in her flesh, noticing those parts of her anatomy were, that were subjected to the greatest stress and strain. The Rio Bochinska's husband, David Lichin, was used for Ben Alligator's movements. 
So yeah, now you know. That's all I gotta say about here. And uh, and then we have Night Owl Mountain and Ave Maria. All right, Night Owl Mountain and Ave Maria. Uh, Night Owl Mountain was directed by Wilfred Jackson. Its story closely follows the description that uh, that. The, the Muzorski had written on his original score on the tone poem. The journal blog was animated by Vladimir Tita. His design was inspired from a pencil sketched by Swiss artist Albert Herder of a, of a demon sitting atop a mountain unfolding its wings. Despite Herder never produced uh, never. Never produced animation for Disney. The studio temporarily hired him to produce pencil sketches for the animators to gain inspiration from. Chernobog temporarily uh, temporarily hired them to produce. Uh, Chernobog and parts of the segment were developed further by Danish for illustrator K. Nielsen. The uh, Tindak conducted the, uh, the conducted research on all the characters he had animated, and being Ukrainian, was familiar with the folklore that the uh, the, the story. <laughs> The story detailed. After Bela Lugosi, Lugosi, best known for his role in Dracula from 1931, was brought in to provide to provide reference poses for Chernobyl, but Tita, but Tita, disliked the results. He he then got Jackson to pose shirtless for, which gave him the images he needed. At one point in his development, the idea of using black cats to represent evil was considered, but Disney rejected it as he thought cats had always been used. The film's program reads that Ave Maria provides an emotional relief to audience to audience tents from the shock of Diablo Mountain. Disney did not want uh, did not want much animated movement, but wanted the segment to to bring the background artwork to the forefront. And, uh, an early sorry outline mm, mm, had the segment mm, end with a Madonna presented uh, presented on screen on the screen with the clouds. But Disney decided against this as he did not want to to suggest overly religious imagery. There were ideas of releasing scents throughout the theater during Fantasia, uh, including the smell of incense during Ave Maria. The lyrics to Ave Maria were sung by Julieta Novis. On the sleeve notes of the LP version of the soundtrack, Disney acknowledged the original words as written by Sir Walter Scott, but said that it has been... Decided to use the words specifically written for Fantasia, but by the distinguished American author Rachel Field. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Now let's go to the soundtrack. Sorry about the recording. Sorry about the recording. Uh, Disney wanted to experiment more sophisticated sound recording and reproduction techniques for Fantasia. Music emerging from one speaker behind behind the screen sounds thin, th tinkly, and strainy. We wanted to reproduce such beautiful masterpieces. So the audiences, so the audiences would feel as thought, as thought as they were standing at the podium with Stokowski for the recording of the Social Apprentice in January 1938, and introduced at Disney Collaborating with RCA Corporation for the for using multiple audio channels, which allowed any desired dynamic balance to uh, to be achieved upon playback. The stage was altered acoustically with double plywood, semicircle partitions, and that separated the Oscar in the orchestra into five sections to uh, to increase the the ripper the, the ripper the reparation. Um, though as uh, though as the production of Fantasia developed, the setup for used for the source of apprentice was abandoned for different multi-channel recording arrangements. On January 18, 1939, Sokowski signed an eighteen-month recording an uh, eighteen-month contract with Disney to conduct the remaining pieces with the Philadelphia Orchestra. Recording began that April and lasted for seven weeks at the Academy of Music, the, the orchestra's home, which was chosen for its excellence for its excellent acoustics. In the recording session, thirty-three microphones were were, were were placed around the orchestra to capture the music onto eight uh, onto eight optical sound recording machines placed in the hall's basement. Each one uh, represented an audio channel that focused on a different section of instruments, cellos, and and, ba and basses, violins, brass, vi uh, violas, and woodwinds, and uh, and timpani. The seventh channel was a combination of the of the first six, while while the eighth provides in the, an overall sound of the orchestra at a distance. A ninth channel provided a click track function for the animators to time their drawings to the music. In the forty-two days of recording, 
483,000 feet or 147 meters of film was used. The Disney paid all the expenses, which included the musicians' wages, stage personnel, a music librarian, and the orchestra's manager. That cost almost almost eighteen thousand dollars. When the finished recordings were arrived at the studio, a meeting was held on July 14, 1939, to allow the the artists working on each segment to listen to Stokowski's arrangements and suggest alterations in the sound to work more effectively with their designs. Oh my gosh. So that's all I gotta say. Moving on to Fantasound. Oh my gosh, it's gonna be a long one. Uh, uh, the Disney Brothers contracted uh, contacted D D David Sardoff of RCA regarding the manufacture of a new system that would create the illusion that the actual symphony orchestra is playing in the theater. Sardoff backed out at first due to financial reasons, but agreed in July 1939 to make the equipment so long as, uh, as the Disneys could hold down the estimated two hundred thousand dollars in costs, equivalent to the three 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 point seven million dollars in two thousand nineteen, though it was not actually known how to achieve their their goal. Engineers at Disney RC at Disney and RCA investigated many ideas and tests have ha been made with various equipment setups. The collaboration led to the development of Fantasound, a pioneering stereophonic surround sound system, which involves some processes widely used today including simultaneous multi-track recording, overdubbing, and noise reduction. Fan sound developed in part by Disney engineer with a William Garrity, employed two projectors ready at the same time, with one containing the picture of film with, with a mild trans soundtrack for backup purposes. The other ran a surround film, a sound film that was mixed for from the, uh, the 39, nine tracks required at the Academy for, to four. For uh, the three of which contain the audio for for the left center and right stage speakers respectively, while the fourth became a control track with ampli uh, with amplitude and frequency tones that drove that drove variable gain amplifiers to top the control uh, to top uh, to control the the uh, the volume of the three audio tracks. In addition, there were three. House speakers placed on the left, right, and center of the auditorium that derived from the left and right stage center channels, which acted as surround channels. As the original recording was captured at almost peak modulation and uh, to increase signal noise, uh, to increase signal to noise ratio, the control track was used to restore the dynamics to where Stokowski thought they should look uh, at they should be. For this, a tone-operated gain-adjusting device was built to control the levels of each of the three audio tracks through the amplifiers. The illusion of of sound traveling across the uh, across the speakers was achieved with a device named the Pampa, which directed the the predetermined movement of each audio channel with a control track. Mixing of the sound track required six people to pre uh, to operate. The various uh, pan pots in real time, while Sikowski directed each level and pan change, uh, which was marked on his musical score. To monitor recording labels, Disney used used oscilloscopes with color differentiation, color differentiation, to minimize eye fatigue. To test recording equipment and speaker systems, Disney ordered eight uh, electronic oscillators. For the newly for newly established Hewlett, uh, Hewlett Packard Company, between the individual takes, and prints, and remakes, approximately three million feet of sound film was used in the production of Fantasia. Almost a fifth of the film's budget was spent on recording techniques. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Look, that's, let's go to the release time. Let's go to the release history. Start with the, start with the theatrical runs. 1940 to 1941 road shows with Fantasound. RKL balked at the idea of distributing Fantasia. Which it described as a, a long hair musical and believed it and believed its duration of two hours and five minutes plus intermission was too long for a general release. It relaxed its exclusive distribution contract with Disney, who wanted a more prestigious uh, exhibit in the form of a limited run, run roadshow attraction. A total th of 13 roadshows were held across the, U the, the, the United States, each involving two daily screens with seat reservations put in advance at a higher, a higher prices and 15-minute intermission. Disney hired 
Talk to Phil Salesman Irving Ludwig to manage the first 11 segment, uh, segments, who was given specific instructions regarding the each aspect of the film's presentation, including the setup, uh, including the setup out of outside theater marquees and curtain uh, curtain lighting cues. Patrons were taken to their seats, staffed by uh, by staff hired and trained by Disney, and were given a program book list. Uh, illustrated by uh, by Kyo Fujikawa. Oh my God, this is a lot of fun. Uh, the first world show opened at the Broadway Theater in New York City in night on November thirteenth, nineteen forty. The Disney's had secured a year's lease uh, with the with a venue that was fully equipped with Fantasia, which took personnel a week of uh, of working uh, the working around the clock to install. Proceeds made on the night went to the British uh, went on to the British War Relief Society following the Battle of Britain. Ticket demand was so great that the eight telephone that the eight telephone operators were employed to handle the the, the extra calls while uh, adjoining the uh, while adjoining store was rented out uh, was rented out to catch uh, to cater the the box office bookings. Fantasia ran at the Broadway for forty nine consecutive consecutive weeks, the longest run achieved by a film at that time. The run continued for a, to uh, for a total of 57 weeks until February 28, 1942. The remaining 12 road shows were held throughout, throughout 1941, which included a 39-week run at the Carthay Circle Theater in Los Angeles from January 29th. Fantasia broke the long, uh, the long record at the venue in its 28th, 28th week, a record previously held by Gone with the Wind in its 8th week run at the uh, at the Fulton Theater in Pittsburgh. Uh, in Pittsburgh, charging over... Over fifty thousand people with reservations being made from cities located one hundred miles from the venue. Oh my god! Uh, and um, engagements were also held at the Geary Theater in San Francisco for eight months. They had a theater in Cleveland and for nine uh, for nine weeks. The Majestic Theater in Boston, the Apollo Theater in Chicago, and also Philadelphia, Detroit, Buffalo, Minneapolis, Washington D.C., and Baltimore. Fantasia grossed over three hundred thousand dollars in the in, in the first sixteen weeks in New York, over two over twenty thousand dollars in the opening five weeks in, in San Francisco, and almost and almost the same amount in the in the first ten weeks, both in Los Angeles and Boston. The first eleven road shows earned a total of one point three million dollars by April nineteen forty one, but the the same amount in uh, but the but the eighty five thousand dollars in production and. The, and Installation costs of a single fancy sound setup, along with theaters having to be leased, forced Disney to exceed their loan limits. The onset was the Second World War prevented plans for a potential release in Europe. Normally, the source of as much as 45% per of the studio's uh, loan income. Up to 88 engagements were, uh, that were outlined across five years, but wartime demands for material for material limited the number of fantasy sound prints to seven uh, to sixteen. All but one of the fantasy sound setups were dismantled and given to the war effort. Upon acquiring the film's distribution rights in April 1941, RKL initially continued the roadshow booking policy, but presented the film in, in mono, which is which was easier to exhibit. The combined average receipts from each roadshow was around three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars, which placed Fantasia at an even greater loss than Pinocchio. Oh no, definitely no good, people. Definitely no good. Uh, let's go to nineteen forty-two to nineteen sixty-three runs. So, uh, uh, Disney allowed RKO to handle the general release of Fantasia, but fought the decision to have the film cut. He gave it. Uh, he gave in as the studio needed as much income and to its re to remedy its finance. Says, but refused to cut it himself. You can't get anybody you want to edit it. I could do it with no input from Disney musical uh, the musical director Ed Plum and Ben Sharpstein. Uh, reduced Fantasia to one hour and forty minutes at first, then to one hour and twenty minutes by removing by removing most of Taylor's commentary and the Takata and Fugue and the Takata and Fugue. Fantasia was released in January 1942 at more popular prices with a mono soundtrack and was placed on the lower half of uh, of double bills. And with the Western film uh, with the Western film Valley of the Sun. RKO reissued Fantasia once more on September 1st, 1946, with the animated sequences completed and complete and the scenes of Taylor, Stokowski, and the orchestra restored, but shortened. Its runtime was restored to one hour and fifty-five minutes. This edit would 
uh, this edit would be the standard form for subsequent re-releases and was the basis for the 1990 restoration. By 1955, the original sound negatives began to deteriorate, though though a four-track copy uh, had survived in good condition. Using the remaining Phantom Sound system at the studio, a three-track stereo copy was transferred across noise-free tele telephone wires onto magnetic film at an RCA facility in Hollywood. This copy was used when Fantasia reissued in stereo at by a Buena Vista distribution in Superscope, a, 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 derivative, a, a, a derivative of the an anamorphic widescreen cinema, the cinema scope format. On February 7, 1956, the projector featured an automatic, automatic control mechanism designed by Disney engineers that was, cru that, that, that was coupled to a very variable anamorphic lens, which allowed the picture to switch between its Academy Standard Ratio of one to of one point three three by one to the ratio to the y ratio of two point three five by one in twenty seconds without a break in the film. Yeah, uh, this was achieved by placing the cues that control the mechanism on a separate track in addition to the three audio channels. Only selected parts of the animation were stretched, while all live action scenes remained unchanged. This reissue garnered some criticism from for viewers, as widescreen format led to the cropping and reframing framing of the images. On February twentieth, nineteen sixty-three, Fantasia was released in both was re-released in both standard and SuperScope versions with stereo sound, though existing records are unclear. Its running time was fifty-six seconds longer than the previous issue, which is unexplained. This was the final release that occurred before Disney's death in nineteen sixty-six. Oh boy, that's definitely good. All right, we've gone to the 1969 to 1990 runs. Fantasia to be uh, began to make a profit for its 2.28 million dollar budget after its re return to theaters on December 17, 1969. The film was promoted with a psychedelic style advertising campaign, and it became popular among teenagers and college students who reportedly appreciated. It. Uh, as a psychedelic experience, animator Ollie Johnson recalled uh, uh, recalled that young people thought we were on a trip when we made it. E every time we go to talk to a school or something, they ask us what what they were on. The release is also noted for the controversial removal of four scenes from the pastoral symphony over racial stereotyping. Fantasia was re was issued on a regular basis, typically for exhibition. In art houses in college towns until the mid 1970s, the film was reissued nationwide once more on April 15, 1977. This time with a simulated stereo sound. This edit featured the RKO distribution logo being replaced by the the being replaced by uh, being replaced with that of Buena Vista distribution. This RKO had not been part of a release since 1946, though it, it had not been removed earlier as the credit sequence would have. Well, we're required, required to be a reshot, a two hour, a, a two and a half hour, a, a two and a half hour, a, a two and a half minute, uh, re the reduction in the film's running time in this version that remains unclear in existing records. In 1980, the studio shipped a damaged segment of the Nutcracker Suite to various film restoration companies, such as each advised that the sound recording could not be upgraded to a to a quality suitable for theatrical for theater screenings. Home. Um, by early 1982, Disney decided to replace the, Stu the, the Stokowski Charge soundtrack with a new digital recording in Dolby Stereo with conductor Erwin Costal. Uh, Disney executive Ron W. Miller said that the original uh, de degraded and no longer matched, uh, no longer matched the extraordinary visuals. Costal directed a 121 piece uh, orchestra and 50 voice choir for the recording that took place. And over 18, season, 18 sessions at the CBS Studio Center in Los Angeles and it cost $1 million to produce. Costal had, had the task of pacing his conducting to match Stokowski's, but, but chose Nikolai Narinsky Korsakov's orchestration of Nile Ball Mountain instead of Stokowski's own arrangement that was used in, in the original. The new recording was also corrected a two 
frame lag in the in the protection caused by the recording techniques used at the time the film was made. The cost of soundtrack was prepared for the film's reissue from April 2nd, 1982, which had Taylor's scenes replaced with briefer voiceover narration from Hugh Douglas as the studio felt audiences now by now had become more sophisticated and knowledgeable about music. No, oh, um... The 1982 version was reissued on February, no, from February 1985, and when kicked off with a run of at at the Plift at the Plit Century Plaza Theater in in Los Angeles, that well, that was the that was fitted with the HPS 4000 digital speaker system. This allowed the 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 digital serial recording of the Costos soundtrack to be presented for the first time and made Fantasia the first theatrical feature film. First set in digital serial sound. The standard recording was used for the film's wide release to around 400 theaters. This time, actor Tim Matheson provided, provided the narration. For his 50th, for his 50th anniversary issue, Fantasia went over, uh, went, underwent a two-year restoration process that had begun with a six-month search to locate the original uh, the original negatives, which had been in, store, in storage since 1946, and, placed, and pieced them together. This was the first time since that a print... It says then a, that a print of the film had been prepared that using the original negative and not a copy. A new print was formed of that was that was formed that was identical to the uh, to the nineteen forty six version with Taylor's introductions restored, but with new end credits, uh, uh, new end credits and uh, new end credits sequence added added. As the opening uh, as the original opening shots of Rice Spring could not be found, footage from the Disney educational film. A war is sport, which uh, which used footage for the for the seven, which used instead. This uh, this was also this was also caused this was also the, this was also the case for a sequence in the Pastoral Symphony, as a so a duplicate was used. Each of the uh, each of the five hundred thirty five thousand six hundred eighty frames were restored by uh, by hand with an untouched uh, print from nineteen fifty one used for guidance on the correct colors and tone. Theaters uh, that agreed to uh, to screen the film were. Required to install a specific stereo sound equipment and present and present it in its original one point three the one point three three by one aspect ratio. The the nineteen ninety reissue also had Stokowski also had the Stokowski soundtrack restored, uh, which underwent a digital remastering by Terry Porter, who worked with the nineteen fifty five magnetic soundtrack. He estimated thirty thousand pops and hisses were removed, were removed from the recording. Released on October fifth, nineteen ninety, the reissue grossed two twenty five million dollars domestically. Man, that's a whole lot. So you know, uh, let's go to the home media. Sorry about audio. Disney considered releasing the film soundtrack around the time of the film's roadshow release, but the idea was not realized. The soundtrack was first released as a Model 3 LP set in 16 countries by Disneyland and Buena Vista Records in 1957, containing the musical pieces without the narration. A stereo audition was issued by Buena Vista Records in 1961. Disney requi was required to obtain permission from Stokowski, who initially rejected its sale unless the Philadelphia Orchestra Association received a share of the royalties. The cost of recording was released on two CDs, two LPs, and two audio cassettes by Buena Vista Records in 1982. In September 1990, the remastered Stokowski soundtrack was released on CD and audio cassette by Buena Vista Records and was later re-released re in 2006. In the United States, it debuted the Billboard 200 chart at number 190, its peak position for the week of November 17, 1990. Two months after its release, the album was certified gold by the Recording Industry, uh, the, by the Recording Industry Association of America, or RIAA, for uh, no, for uh, for fifty for, for five hundred thousand copies and sold in, in the United States. In January nineteen ninety three, it was certified platinum for sales in excess of one million copies. For the film's seventy fifth anniversary in two thousand and fifteen, Stokowski and Coastal Records were released by Walt Disney Records on four CDs as the fifth volume of the Legacy Collection. The set includes. Sokowski's recording of the deleted Claire de Lune segment and a recording of The Sorcerer's Apprentice and Peter and the Wolf from Make My Music with added narration by Sterling Holloway. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Continuing with home media, we go to video, we go to video now. Uh, Fantasia has received three home video releases. 
The, fir the first, featuring the, 19 uh, featuring the 1990 Restored Theatrical Version, was released on VHS, Betamax, and Laserdisc disc on November 1st, 1991, as part of the Walt Disney Classics Collection line. The 50-day release, the 50-day release prompted 9.25 million enhanced orders or cassettes and and a record and a record of 200,000 for discs, doubling the figure of the previous record. The deluxe edition package included the film, a making of feature and a commemorative lithograph, a 16-page booklet, and a two-disc soundtrack of the Stokowski score and certificate of authenticity. Signed by Roy E. Disney, the nephew of Walt. Fantasia became the biggest selling the sell through cassette of all time, with 14.2 million copies being purchased. The record the record was surpassed by Beauty and the Beast in December 1992. This version was also released as a DVD out in 2000 outside of the US, in the United, in the United Kingdom, and other countries. Again, under the Walt Disney Classics banner. In November 2000, Fantasia was released on video for the second time. This time, along with Fantasia 2000 on DVD, with 5.1 surround sound, the films were, were issued both separately and in a three-disc set called the Fantasia the Anthology. Uh, a variety of bonus features, which, which were included in the bonus disc, the, the Fantasia Legacy. This edition attempted to follow as as closely as possible with as possible the runtime and format of the original Roadshow version, and included additional restored. The restored live action footage of Taylor and the orchestra, uh, including the bookends of the, 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 to the film's intermission. Since, since the 2000 release, Deems Taylor's voice was re recorded through, uh, throughout by Corey Burton because most of the audio tracks to Taylor's uh, restored scenes had, uh, had deteriorated to the point that they could no longer be used. Both films were reissued again by Walt Disney Studios Home Entertainment in November 2010 separately as. As a two disc featured ten, uh, as as a two disc Blu Ray slash DVD, uh, as a two disc DVD slash Blu Ray set and a combined DVD and Blu Ray four disc set named the Fantasia Two Movie Collection that featured 1080p high definition video and 7.1 surround sound. The 2010 version of Fantasia featured a featured new music, a new restoration by Reliance Media Works and a new sound restoration but was editorially identical to the 2000 version. This also marked the first time that the first time the Roadshow version was released in Europe. Fantasia uh, was redrawn from release and returned to Disney Vault uh, the Moratorium on April 30th, 2011. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's go to the reception. Starting, starting with the critical response. Early reviews. Yeah, for early reviews. Fantasia garnered significant critical acclaim at the time when at the time of release, and was seen by it was seen by some critics as a marketplace, as a masterpiece. The West Coast premiere at the Carthay Circle Theater was a grand affair, attracting some five thousand people, including Shirley Temple, C.C. Beale DeMille, Forrest Tucker, James Cagney, Robert Montgomery, James Murphy, Edgar Edgar Bergen, and many other notables in the film industry. Among those at the film's premiere was film critic Edwin Schallert of the Los Angeles Times, who considered the film to be a uh, a magnificent achievement in the film, which would go down in cinematic history as a landmark film. Nothing, uh, noting that the rapturous applause the film received by the audience during the various in interludes, he stated. Uh, 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 he stated the. We say that Fantasia was was caviar to the general, ambrosia, ambrosia and nectar for the intelligentsia, and considered the film to be as be courage courageous beyond belief. Music critic of the newspaper Isabel Morris Jones was highly praising of the soundtrack to the film, believing mm, the film, believe, uh, believing that uh, it is a dream of a symphony concert. An enormously varied concert of, of pictorial ideas, uh, no ideas of abstract music by acknowledged, by acknowledged composers, of, of performers, Leopold Sikorsky and orchestra, orchestra players of Hollywood and Philadelphia, and for the vast majority, new and wonderful sound effects. Bosley Crowther of the New York Times, also at the premiere, noted that the motion picture history was made last night. Fantasia dumps, dumps conventional formulas overboard and reveals the scope of the 
the freedom of the scope of films for imaginative excavation. Fantasia is simply terrific. Payne Boswell, an editor at Art Digital at Art Digest, called it an aesthetic experience, experience, experience never to be forgotten. Time magazine described at the described the premiere as stranger and more wonderful than than any of Hollywood's and the experience of fantasy sound as if the hearer were in the midst of the music. As the music sweeps to a climax, it frots it, it frots over the proscenium, the proscenium arch. The arch boils into the rear of the theater. Boils into the rear uh, into the rears of the theater. But all prances all but prances up and down the aisles. Uh, yes, Dance magazine devoted its lead story to uh, devoted its lead story to the film, saying that the most extraordinary thing about Fantasia is to a dancer or a ballet to main, not the miraculous musical recording, the range hailed the range of color or the fountainous integrity of the Disney collaborators, but quite simply the perfection of its dancing. Variety also hailed Fantasia, calling it a success, a successful experiment to lift the relationship from the plane of popular mass entertainment to the higher to the higher strata of appeal to lovers of classical music. The Chicago Tribune assigned three writers to cover the film's Chicago premiere. Society columnist Harry, uh, Harriet Pribble, film critic May Tinney, and music critic Edward Berry. Pribble left amazed at the brilliantly attired audience, while, while Tinney felt the film was beautiful. But it, also, but it is also bewildering. It is stupendous. It is colossal. It is an overwhelmingly ambitious orgy. The orgy of color, sound, and imagination. Barry was pleasant with the program of good music and well performed and beautifully recorded, and felt pleasantly distracted from the music to what to what was shown on the screen and as a scene. In a breakdown of reviews from both film and music critics, Disney author Paul Anderson found thirty three percent to be very positive, twenty two percent both positive and positive and negative, and eleven percent negative. Man, that's all I find. Um, those who adopted a more negative view at at the time of the film's release came most came mostly from the classical music community. Many took fault with Stokowski's rearrangements and uh, and abridgments of the music. Igor Stravinsky, the only living composer whose music was featured in the film, expressed the di- 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 displeasure at how Stokowski's arrangement of the Rite of Spring, in order that the order of the play uh, of the pieces had been shuffled, and the most difficult of them eliminated, and criticized the orchestra's uh, performance, observing that the simplification of the score did not say the mus- did not save the musical performances, the performance which was execrable. Oh my gosh! Um, other composers, other composers, and music critics le- leveled criticism at the premiere of the film itself, arguing that that presenting classical music with visual I- images that would rob the musical pieces of their I- integrity. Composer and music critic Virgil Thompson, Thompson praised Fan of Sound with which he thought offered good, good transmission of music, but disliked the musical taste of Stokowski, with the exception to Fantasia. With the exception to the Sorcerer's Apprentice and the Rite of Spring, all in doubts of the New York Times, too hailed the quality of sound that Fantasy Sound preserved uh, presented, but said much of Fantasia distracted from, from or directly uh, injured the, the scores. Film critic Pauline Cal dismissed parts of Fantasia as uh, grotesquely uh, kitschy. Some parents resisted praying. They are paying the higher roadshow prices for their children, and several complained that the Nile Ball Mountain segment had frightened them. There were also a few negative reactions that uh, that were most political in nature, especially since the film's release happened at the time when the, when Nazi Germany reigned a Germany reigned a supreme in Europe, reigned supreme in Europe. One review of the films of the film in that in this manner, written by Dorothy Thompson for the York, for the York Herald Tribune. On November 20, 25th, 1940, was especially harsh. Thompson claimed that she left the theater in a condition bordering on nervous breakdown because the film was a remarkable nightmare. Thompson went on to create, went on to compose, uh, to compare the film uh, to a rampant Nazism, which she described as the uh, as the abuse of power and a moving titch, uh, power and. 
and the perverted, uh, and perverted portrayal of the best instincts. Thompson also claimed that the film depicted its depicted nature as being titanic, while the man was only a moving legend on the stone of, of time. She concluded, uh, she concluded that the film was cruel, brutal, and brutalizing, and a negative caricature of the two last segments that were about enough for Maria, because she did not want to be subject up to any more of the film's brutalization. So yeah, that's pretty much it. All I can say about here. Let's go to later reviews. Let's go to let's go to let's go to later reviews. Fantasia holds a ninety five percent rating based on a sample of fifty five reviews, with an average rating of eight of eight point six four out of ten on Rotten Tomatoes, a website uh, which aggregates film reviews. The website's critical consensus reads a landmark animation and a huge influence on the on the medium of music of music video. Disney's Fantasia is relentlessly invent inventive, blend is a relentlessly inventive blend of the classics with fan no, with with phantasmagorical uh, images. A Metacritic, the film has weighed an average score of ninety six out of one hundred based on eighteen critics, including indicating universal acclaim. TV Guy awarded the film uh, four stars, calling it the most ambitious animated feature uh, animated feature to ever come out. Uh, of the Disney Studios, noting how the film in integrates famous artworks of classical music with wildly uneven but extraordinarily uh, imaginative visuals that run the gamut from dancing hippos to, to the purely abstract. Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun Times really rated the film four uh, four stars out of four, and noted that uh, noted that throughout Fantasia, Disney pushed. The, the the edges of the envelope. However, Empire Magazine only, uh, only rated it two stars out of five. Poor. Concluding this is a concluding this is a very patchy affair. While some of the animated pieces work, others come across as a down, as downright insane. But the remarks have also been made out of Fantasia, not being a children's film. Relig uh, uh, religion writer Mark I. Pinsky considers Fantasia to be one of the more problematic of Disney's animated features in that it was intended as much as for adults as as children and not what and not what people had come to expect. Uh oh. Definitely not good. Let's go to the awards and honors. Fantasia was ranked fifth at the nineteen forty uh, National Board of uh, National Board of Reviews uh, in the top uh, the National Board of Review Awards in the top ten films category, Disney and Sokowski won a special award for the film at the 1940 New York Phil uh, New York Film Critics Choice Circle Awards. Fantasia was the subject of uh, of two Academy Honorary Awards on February 26, 1942. One for Disney, William Garrity, John and A. Hawkins, and the RCA Manufacturing Company for their outstanding contribution to the advancement of the use of the use of sound and motion pictures. Through the production, uh, through the production of Fantasia, and the other, to Sikowski and his associates for their unique achievement in the creation of a new form of visual music and entertainment, as and as an art form. In 1990, Fantasia was selected for a uh, for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. On the on the 100th anniversary of cinema in, 19, in 1995, the Vatican. Including Fantasia in its list of forty-five great of the greatest mm, of forty-five great films made under the art category. Other the others being religion and values. Fantasia is featured in three lists that rank the greatest American films as determined by the American Film Institute. The films the film ranked number fifty-eight in, in one hundred years, one hundred movies in nineteen ninety-eight before it was dropped from its for its tenth. Uh, for his ranking in the 10th anniversary version in 2007. Though it was nominated f for inclusion, the 10 top 10 uh, list formed in 2008, placing Fantasia, uh, placed Fantasia fifth under animation. So, yeah, that's all I gotta say. <laughs> Alright. I don't know. Let's go to controversies. In the late 1960s, four shots from the Pastoral Symphony were removed depicted that, that depicted two characters 
in a racially stereotyped manner. A black centaurette called Sunflower was depicted polishing the hooves of a white uh, of a white centaurette. And a second name named Otika appear appeared briefly during the process, process scenes with Bacchus and his followers. According to Disney archivist David Smith, the sequence was aired uncut and uh, on, on television in 1963 before the edits were made for the film's 1969 theatrical release. John Carnegie, the the editor responsible for for being uh, being the 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 for the the for the wait um let's try again um uh, John Carter Ken Chen the editor responsible for the nineteen uh, for the change in the nineteen ninety one video release said it's sort of appealing to me that that these stereotypes were ever put in film credit watch Eber com uh, commented on the pu uh, on the edit while the original film should of course be preserved for historical purposes. There is no need to with for the general release version to prepare for uh, to perpetrate racial st uh, racist stereotypes in a film designed primarily for children. The edits have been uh, have been placed have been placed in all subsequent the edge core and home video releases. In May 1992, the, the Philadelphia Orchestra Association filed a lawsuit against the Walt Disney Company and Board of Vista Home Video. The orchestra maintained that as a co-worker of uh, co-creator Fantasia, the group was. Entitled to half of the estimated one hundred twenty million dollar, one hundred twenty million dollars in profits from video and laser disc sales, the orchestra dropped its dropped its case in nineteen ninety four when the two parties reached an undisclosed settlement at a court. British music publisher Bo the Bosnia Hawks filed a further lawsuit in nineteen ninety three, contending that Disney did not have uh, the Rights to distribute the Rite of Spring in, in the 1991 video releases because the permission granted to Disney by Stravinsky in 1940 was only in the context of a film to be shown in theaters. The United States District D District Court backed B Bosnia Hawks' case in 1996, but the second court, but the second circuit court, the circuit court of, of appeals reversed the ruling in 1998, stating that Disney's original license. For motion picture rights extends to video format distribution. So yeah, that's very That's it for the controversy. Now let's continue additional material. Disney have wa wanted Fantasia to be an ongoing project with a new edition being released every few years. His plan was to substitute one of the original segments with a new one as it was completed. So it, so audiences would always see a new version of the film. From January to August 1941, story material was developed based on additional musical works, including Ride the Valkyries by Richard Wagner, The, the Swan of tu Tuanella by John Silvius, Invasion to the Invitation to the Dance by Carl Maria von Wipper, the Polka and the The Polka and Fugue from Schwan the Red Piper by Jarmir Weinberger, Bequis by Frederick Chopin, and Fly of the Bumblebee by Nikolai by Nikolai Rimsky Kor uh, Korsakov, which was later adopted into the Bubble Bo Boogie segment in Melody Time for 1948. And I'll talk about it in future episodes, so please stay tuned. Uh, the film's disappointing, disappointing initial box office performance and the USA's entry into World War II brought an end to these plans. Deems Taylor prepared introductions for The Firebird by Stravinsky, La Mera by Claude Debussy, Adventures in a per the, the, the Permambulator by John Alden Carpenter, Don Quixote by Richard, uh, Richard Strauss, and Pictures and Exhibition by uh, uh, Busorgsky to have them have them for the future in case we decide to make any one of them. Mm -hmm. I know. At another segment, Debussy's Claire La Lune was developed as part of the film's original program. After being completely uh, being animated, it was cut out from the final. It was cut. It, it was cut out. The final film short uh, to short its lengthy front time. The, the the animation depicted two great uh, the great white heroines flying through the Florida Everglades on a moonlit night, which uh, which more. With with more, uh, on the light, with more focus towards the serious background art. The, all right. Uh, the animation depicted two great white heroines, heroines flying through, uh, flying through the Florida Everglades on a moonlit night, with more focus towards the the segment's background art. The animation. The, the animation. I know. Uh, the sequence was later edited. 
it was later edited and re rescored to for the Blue Bayou segment in Make My Music from 1946. Again, in a future episode, please stay tuned. Uh, in, 19, in 1992, a work print of the of, of the original was discovered and Claire Lelu was restored, complete with the original soundtrack of Stokowski with the Philadelphia Orchestra. It was included as a bonus feature in the Fantasia Anthology DVD in 2000. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's go to the legacy for the sequel. In 1980, the Los Angeles Times reported that animators... Wolfgang, Ryder Man, and Mel Shaw have begun work on music on an ambitious concept mixing jazz, classical music, myths, modern art, and more. Following the old Fantasia format, animation historian Charles Solomon wrote that uh, wrote that development took place between 1982 and 1983, which combined ethnic tales from around the world with the music of the various countries. Proposed segments for the film included included a battle between an ice god and a sun goddess set to Finlandia by Sibelius. But uh, the one, the one set in the honest uh, to the songs, uh, the the uh, of of Ima Sumak, another featuring caricatures of Louis Armstrong and El uh, and Ella Fitzgerald, and uh, and, an, uh, and an adaptation of the of the Emperor's Nightingale, which would have featured Mickey as the Nightingale's owner, similar to his role in The Sorcerer's Apprentice. This uh, this project was shelved in favor of Mickey's Christmas Carol. Roy E. Disney, the nephew of Walt, co-produced Fantasia 2000, which entered production in 1990 and featured seven new segments <laughs> performed, performed, by, performed by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra with, 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 conductor, with conductor James Levine. The Sorcerer's Apprentice is the only segment retained from the original film. Fantasia 2000 premiered at, the Carnegie, premiered at Carnegie Hall on December 17, 1999 as part of a five-city live concert hall followed by a four-month engagement in IMAX cinemas and a wide release in regular theaters. In 2000, early development for a third film began in 2002, with a working title of Fantasia 2006. Plans were made, plans were made to include the, the Little Match Girl by Roger Allers and One by One by Peak, Show, by Peak Show Hunt in the film, before the project was shelved in 2004, with the proposed segments released as individual short films. On October 25, 2019, it was announced that Disney is developing a project based on Fantasia for its streaming service, Disney+. Plus. Man, it's a lot of fun. Let's get to the live-action adaptations. The Sorcerer's Apprentice segment was adapted by Jerry Bruckheimer into the feature-length movie The Sorcerer's Apprentice in 2010. The Nutcracker Suite segment serves as a partial inspiration for the feature-length movie The Nutcracker and the Four Rubs in 2018. The Diablo Mountain segment was reported in 2015 as being in development by Disney Productions for a feature-length live-action film with a treatment written by Matt Sazama and Burke Sharp Sharpless. So, yeah, I know. Going to the parodies and spin-offs. Fantasia is parodied in A Corny Concerto, a Warner Brothers cartoon from 1943 of the Mary Melody series. The short features Elmer Fudd in the role of Taylor, wearing his wearing his style glasses, who introduces two segments of set to pieces by John Strauss, Tales tail for the Vienna Wood and the Blue that it Wants, the former, the former, the former featuring Porky and Bugs as the, and the latter, Featuring Doug, featuring Daffy. In 1976, uh, the, the Italian animator uh, Italian animator Bruno Bozzetto produced Allegro no Troppo, a feature lay parody of Fantasia. The anime the television series the, the Simpsons re references Fantasia in, few, in, a, in a few episodes. Matt Grunning, the creator of the, of the franchise, expressed a wish to make a parody of a film named Simpsasia. It, it was never produced. Partly because it would have been too difficult to write a feature-length script. In Treehouse of Horror 4, director David Silverman had admired the animation in Night of Ball Mountain and made the first appearance of, of Devil Flanders resemble Chernobog. The, the episode, Itchy and Scratchy Land, references the Sorcerer's Apprentice in snippet title uh, 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 Scratch Stasia, which features the music and several shots parodying it exactly. In 2014, BBC Music created a music educational scheme similar to Fantasia called Ten Pieces, intended to introduce children to classical music. Spanning two films in 2014 and 2015, several pieces featured in the Fantasia films are also included. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's go to the theme parks. From 2001 to 2015, the Sorcerer's Hat was the icon of Disney's Hollywood Studios, one of the four theme parks located at the Walt Disney World Resort. The structure was... One of the magic, uh, the structure was of the magic hat from the Sorcerer's Apprentice, also located at the 
Okay, also looking at the resort is Fantasia Gardens, a miniature golf course that integrates characters and objects from the film in each uh, in each hole. The fireworks and water show and uh, uh, fantastic feature scenes from the Sorcerer's Apprentice and other Fantasia segments on water projection screens. It involves the plot of Mickey Mouse as the apprentice doing magic whilst also battling the Disney villains. For the 20th anniversary of Disneyland Paris, Mickey was depicted in a special edition of his Sorcerer's Apprentice outfit with his friends wearing similar outfits. The Night of Ball Mountain segment is featured in the storybook Lands Canal Boats Attraction at Disneyland Park in Paris. Man, that's a whole lot of fun. Over in the video games, in 1983, Atari released a video game called Sorcerer's Apprentice for the Atari 2600. Based on that segment of Fantasia, the, the player, as Mickey Mouse, must, co co must collect falling stars and comets, which will prevent the marching brooms from flooding Yetsin's, uh, Yetsin's cavern. Again, yes, it is Disney spelled backwards to keep that in mind. In 1991, a side scrolling Fantasia video game developed by Infogames was released for the Sega Mega Drive slash Genesis games uh, system. The, the player controls Mickey Mouse, must find busy musical notes scattered across four elemental worlds based upon the film's segments. There are several film reels, uh, several film reel reel levels based on some of the movie's segments, as such as Social Apprentice and Night Up on Mountain, that appear in Epic Mickey Games. <laughs> you know, uh, Yet Sid and, uh, and Chernobyl also make cameo appearances in the games. Yet Sid from the source, the sorcerer from the Sorcerer's Apprentice narrates the openings and endings of the two games and served as the creator of the Wasteland. Turn about the demon from the uh, from the Night Owl Mountain slash Ivor Maria segment appears as a painting in the first game and appears in the Night of Ball Mountain film reels levels in the uh, in the second. The the Disney slash Square Enix crossover game series Kingdom Hearts features Shredderbach as a boss in the first installment. The Night Ball Mountain piece is played during the, during the fight. Yes, it appears frequently in the series installment. Uh, uh, appears in the series movie. In the series, beginning with Kingdom Hearts 2, voiced in English by Corey Burton, Symphony of Sorcery, a world, a world, a world based on the movie, appears in Kingdom Hearts 3D, Drop Dead, uh, Three Drop Distance, like the Timeless River World in Kingdom Hearts, uh, in Kingdom Hearts 2, it is featured as a period of Mickey Mouse's past. Fantasia Music Evolved, a music game, was developed by, Har by Harmonix in association with Disney Interactive for the Xbox 360 and, X1 con and Xbox One consoles. The game utilizes the Kinect device to put players in control of of music in a manner similar to Har to Harmonix's previous rhythm games, affecting the virtual affecting the virtual environment and interactive objects within it. The game features the, the game features licensed contemporary rock music such as Queen and Bruno Mars, Mickey, and his sort of apprentice guys, uh, Geese. Appears as a playable character in Disney Infinity. So, yes, very much it. Over in the concert, a live concert a presentation of the film named Disney Fantasia Live in Concert showcases various segments from both Fantasia and Fantasia 2000. The concert version features a live symphony orchestra and a piano soloist accompanying the projected high definition video segments. The Fantasia concert was still touring throughout the world as of late 2014. So, yes, very much it. In television, Several elements from the film appear in the television series Once Upon a Time. The Hat for the Sorcerer's Apprentice appears in the fourth se season episode, A Tale of Two Sisters. As the series progressed, the Hat was shown to have the ability to absorb others, and those it absorbed would, uh, would appear as a star on the Hat. The Sorcerer's Apprentice himself makes an appearance, where he is an, an old man who guards the Hat in the Enchanted Forest. Chernobyl from Nyan Ball Mountain also makes an appearance in the episode Darkness on the Edge of Town. Mm, yeah. And finally, let's wrap up let's, let's wrap up this episode with the credits. So, musical score is conducted by Leopold Sikowski, performed by the Philadelphia Orchestra, except as noticed. So, yeah, very much it. But that's it, guys. That's it. That's it for Fantasia. Yay! It only took one hour and 23 minutes to get the job done. But that's it, guys. Let's get to the final last ring for this, for this, for this movie. Man. So what are we? One is abysmal, two is terrible, three is awful, four is bad, five is mad, six is okay, seven is good, eight is okay, and nine, nine is amazing, ten is perfect. So what do I think about this story? What do I think about this movie? I really love it. Man, 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 I really love this story. I went, I went the entire page. Oh my gosh. But with that in mind, guys, Fantasia is definitely the bomb. With that being said, I really love it so much. Can't wait to see more of that. On scale one to ten, I'm ready. Fantasia with a score of... With a almost perfect score of 9.5 out of 10. 
Yeah! Per yeah, amazing to perfect. But yes, pretty much it. 9.5, meaning 9.5 out of 10. So yeah, that's all I gotta say. It's amazing to perfect. So now you know, just as I expected. And that is pretty much it for me. I love Fantasia so much. I can't wait to see more of that in the future. But that's only my personal and conservative opinion. Feel free to agree or disagree with any of your thoughts and videos in the comment section down below. But with that, my guys, that's it. That's it. That's over. Thank you all so much for watching another episode of Movie History. Yay! Oh my gosh. Walt Disney Animation Studios. So, man, uh, uh, we made through nearly 90 minutes of full information so, uh, just for you. And that was a very, very, very long video uh, to this day. But we hope you guys enjoyed it. So thank you so much for tuning in today. We will be see you. We'll be back very, very soon with another episode. But but don't go anywhere. We have two new episodes of Boshi Sleep Story Reactions as well as a new episode of Boshi Monsters by Free later on today. But without my guys, <sighs> all things will come to an end. I want to thank you all for tuning in today. You are the best. I really love you. <sighs> Man, that's a lot of fun. Anyway, thanks for watching everybody. I'm Big Sanchez. You'll be yourself. And I will see you next time on Movie History, Walt Disney Animation Studios. Please join me again next time for episode four as we can, as we take a look at Dumbo. We're going to be, it's, it's, that's why we're going to be taking a look at Dumbo next time. Get ready to fly out to the skies and get ready for lots of great times and great adventures. So stay tuned. You know what if it's it. We're going to be the Flight Elephant Elephant next time. Episode 4 will be, will be about Tempo. So we will see you there. For now, thank you so much for watching this episode. This long awaited episode. With one hour and 25 minutes of, uh, of information. This is the longest, longest episode of movie history ever. So thank you so much for watching. Until the next time I see you, I'm Miguel Sanchez. Reminding you to please remember to leave a like. Share this video with your friends. Leave a comment down below. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Also, turn on notifications to never miss a new video. It took one hour, and it took less than one hour and 30 minutes to do the on. Anyways, uh, please subscribe when notifications turn on to not miss another new video from me, as we're on the road to 600 subscribers. Thank you all so much for watching this very long-awaited video. We will see you on the next one. And, and please stay tuned for two new episodes of Moshi Sleep Story Reactions, as well as Moshi Monsters Biography later on today. God bless and happy gaming. I'm Miguel Sanchez for everyone here at Movie History, Walt Disney Animation Studios. Have a great day. And I'll see you real soon. Like, favorite, subscribe. I'm Miguel Sanchez. And I'll see you in another video. Laters!